So I woke up a few days ago and received a notification from YouTube congratulating me on my Hollow Knight Bosses video for hitting half a million views, and I was happy for about two seconds before I was reminded of how much flack it got, and then I was sad for about two seconds before I reminded myself I'm under no obligation to give a USDA certified organic fuck, but nonetheless 500k is a pretty neat milestone, so what better way to celebrate than to grab our spades and shovel this outdated, incomplete excuse for a controversy straight into the abyssal void where it belongs. So now, with more than twice the amount of bosses to work with, and since I saw a huge number of people requesting this anyways, let's wash this slate clean and begin anew with a fresh buffet of big bad baddies to size up and respectively cut down. Bringing up the very back of the list is the MMC, the Massive Miserable Cucumber. Identified by the Hunter's Journal as the Massive Moss Charger, but as mortifying as that moniker may come across, this monumentally malformed clunk poses only a marginally minor concern to your journey. This mangled miscarriage of calamity may use his macho magnified chaparral to mask his mead-mannered conceit, but much to my chagrin, this turns out to be a very misleading measure of his competence. Literally just stand in one spot and make mincemeat of this cornball, making it majorly clear that this meandering mesozoic cactus is but a meager match for your cutlass. To make my conclusion, murdering this moronic carapace isn't the most miraculous conquest, but after you finish mopping the mat with this cretin, you can finally move on to something much more challenging. Unfortunately for the linearity of this video, this next boss is not that challenge. This is likely going to be the very first boss you fight if you're a newcomer to the game, and let me tell you, nothing sets the stage for exploring a depressing post-apocalyptic dust bowl, quite like murdering a pregnant mother and watching eight of her prematurely born children eat their way out of her corpse before, well, slicing them up too. Like the night is about to prepare itself an eight-layer gruzzer souffle. The pixie wings on its back can somehow pilot this octomom around and keep her airborne, but on top of being aerodynamically impossible, her only means of defense is lunging back and giving all her kids severe head trauma by pinballing herself up and down the room. This boss is like grading a shitty middle school history essay. You almost feel bad because you know the kid's probably troubled or something and he really did put a lot of work behind it, but once you're knee deep in the process of ripping it apart, you just don't really care. But you better not be getting too comfortable because this game shows no hesitance in amping up its difficulty in a way that would make Japanese bullet shooters look like a friendly game of ping pong. Just when you think you're safe from the insect horns, they throw a second bloated bug bastard at you, only this time he can yell really loud. Yeah, pretty intimidating, right? You'll find the Vengefly King holding hostage what I first thought was the knight's long lost cousin and his dreadful looking teeth, and we all know how critical this guy is to the story, so we can't just leave him hanging around. Don't be intimidated by this scissor headed degen and his false nobility rank because because apparently the only thing this guy is the king of is redundant attack patterns. His main attack is a low swooping jaws open I'm coming for you charge that you could only possibly miss time jumping over if you slid back in your cord tangled chair and accidentally unplugged your monitor, and once you've downstruck him with your nail he retaliates by doing the exact same thing until he's dead, save tossing a couple of his minions at you. Next. The False Knight has earned from me the title of Hardest Introductory Boss, which is sort of like being the toughest freshman in high school. You may think you're a hard ass, but everyone that's older than you looks at you as nothing but a walking joke. And the False Knight himself is no different. The only reason I'm putting him here is because he's the only introductory boss with more than two attacks. But I mean shit, you can have a trio of old scooters rusting away in your garage and you can technically say you own more than a couple vehicles, so at the end of the day it doesn't really matter that much. They're all still easy as hell to dodge because he takes 15 Mississippis just to find the motor motivation to swing his damn club, and once you've knocked him down, his face pops out of his helmet like a budget jack-in-the-box allowing you to whack him a few times. Repeat until dead. Easy. The Broken Vessel was a boss I actually received some disagreements on way back when during the first upload of my boss's video. So, Broken Vessel is easier than your mom, and I'm gonna do my best to explain why, through my many playthroughs of the game, I have never once thought of this boss as that challenging. He has two main attacks, a horizontal leap forward and a downward thrusting attack that's, again, not that hard to dodge. And no, the same lunge only lifted three feet in the air does not count as a different attack. But once you get him down to enough health, those same attacks will start slinging out the infection that has parasitized him. Just don't overthink these attacks. 9 times out of 10, dodging these things can be as simple as stepping just a little to the left or right. Worse yet, when he starts headbanging in the center of the room while throwing off-brand dragon balls at you, you can literally guarantee your safety by just standing on one end of the arena. And whenever an orange ball of pain floats your way, just quickly peek back in for a second and then return to the edge of the screen. 
That's right, Hollow Knight Bosses V2.0, now featuring Dream Warriors. Batting Marmor away is just like playing a friendly game of ping pong with your pals, only if that ping pong ball swelled up to 20 times its size, grew a face and tail, and started assaulting you. He's the guy that never gets invited to any of the fancy Dream Warrior parties the rest of his brothers have, but somehow he manages to sneak in for five minutes and eat all the chips. Marmor gives me a feeling that he's attached to a string on the end of my nail, because there's never any downtime in this fight, which is the only reason I've put him here in this spot above most of the intro bosses. You actually kinda do have to pay just a little attention to what you're doing, because every once in a blue moon, Marmu will ricochet off the corner of the wall like a DVD logo, and the bounce physics will just decide to dick you over for no better reason than, haha, I can. But even with that curveball, this fight is still nothing but a glorified paddle ball simulator. Despite the Fluke Marm not really giving you that many opportunities to heal, this nematode is pretty straightforward. The Fluke Marm has one glaring weakness in that it cannot move, and therefore the only way it can ever dodge anything you throw at it is if you're actually just that bad. The Thorns Charm is nice here because it finishes off those pesky flying turnips the Fluke Marm ejects from one of its many assholes, and it keeps you from getting too overwhelmed. Otherwise, the Glowing Womb here is a nasty strat against the boss. It pretty much trivializes this whole fight because as long as you're swinging at something and getting soul, your little minions continue spotting. Plus, like I said before, there aren't really that many opportunities to heal, so you might as well be doing something with all that extra soul. The Soul Warrior in the Soul Sanctum is hardly even a boss, but I went on ahead and smacked it on in here because your first encounter with this enemy is so flashy and dramatic that it might as well be its own mini-boss or something. Plus, he appears as a boss in the God Home, so that means he's a boss, sue me. The Soul Warrior can teleport, and that's probably the most interesting thing about it, if I'm being honest. Don't let this guy intimidate you with his quick, flashy attacks, because this pill bug's got a pretty nice array of moves on him, but as we've already established, you can own all the houses you want, but if they're all lacking insulation and a few of them are missing a roof, then your ass is still in trouble when winter comes. All of his moves can be pretty easily dodged, and this boss does that thing where he goes really fast to trick you into thinking he's also challenging. Spoiler alert, he's neither. I was wondering why this chick spent her entire time in the green path running from me. I thought it was just because she was rushing to get to an appointment or just really had to take a piss somewhere, I don't know. But it turns out she was just running from you because she's just ass at fighting. As an intro boss, some of her attacks can be a little confusing to follow at times. The only really annoying thing about her is the pre-attack animation where she jumps into the air and makes you think she's just gonna dive on top of you again. But before you can react appropriately, you find yourself being lashed across the face with a strand of ethereal pasta. The only power you'll likely have at this point is the vengeful spirit upgrade, so this boss is kind of expected to be easy. She flies around and tries to give the appearance that she actually poses a threat, but if you use the secret ancient hidden technique of the directional buttons, you can dodge just about anything in the fight. This boss scared the shitting Christ out of me because I was walking up to him expecting him to be an NPC that would offer me advice or, I don't know, give me a gift or something. And as soon as all that was done, he would pick his fat pink ass up and move out of the way so I could sit down and change my charm loadout. But he just sits there and does nothing. Make one wrong move though and the crystal miner takes this as a challenge and tries to fry your face off with his akimbo flashlight hands. He spends the rest of the fight shooting his laser pointers at you like you're a cat with an attention disorder. And despite his frightening command over lasers, he seems to be downright mystified by the age-old combat technique of jumping. He then hops around in a sort of random pattern, but I feel like half the time he does this, he just jumps from one side of you to the next. So you can literally just stand still and jump over his lasers while he continues his gymnastics routine. Gorb is the byproduct of a snail that accidentally went too fast and headbutted a peacock with such velocity that they have since merged into one cohesive being and have become Gorb, which might be an onomatopoeia to represent the sound made by such a collision. Gorb has three phases and they're all straightforward as hell. He launches spears until you get him to lower HP, then he launches two rounds of spears until you get him down to his last phase in which he launches not one, not two, but three rounds of sharp golden projectiles at you before finally accepting his defeat and worming his way back into the grave he leapt from. Gorb can be an asshole sometimes, his flight patterns are just erratic enough to not land a hit every single time you upstrike, but the closer you get to him, the more likely you are to be poked by one of his ethereal pencils, so any nail lengthening charms you have on you will help immensely. The Soul Master, once again a moniker given and probably self-appointed for no further reason than to try and intimidate you. Thankfully for your health bar, the only thing this guy is a master of is teleporting away with his tail tucked between his short, stubby little legs. And as soon as an attack goes through, he's teleported off screen to go grab a quick soda or something, and then nonchalantly pops back in like, hey what's up, hello, and continues with his Tom fuckery. He mainly attacks with projectiles, so if you're good at dodging that, then this fight probably won't be that big of a deal. He moves around so much that it's easier to just pick a general vicinity of the arena 
and just stay there and wait for him to levitate toward you. Get him down low enough and he finally gives his balls a tug and goes all not even my final form on your ass and starts aggressively headbutting the floor. He even tosses in a quick arena change to show you he really means business. Unfortunately for him though, he only goes from the master of cowardice to the master of self-inflicted headaches, because as soon as he's done, he stands still and fires a couple projectiles at you, and if your nail is strong enough, you can just wallop him right there before he even has a chance to fly back up. Easy peasy. Elder Who attacks you by aggressively making Krabby Patties in the air and then throwing them down on the ground because they all taste like ass. At almost any given time, these attacks can be completely and safely evaded by either stepping two feet in one direction or shadow dashing out of harm's way when he tries to corner you with that two-pronged pincer attack of his. Like any Dream Warrior boss, his one glaring weakness is the inability to block his balls from being continually sliced over and over again. As we get into the other Dream bosses, you're gonna notice that ends up being a pretty redundant motif. For whatever reason, these guys just really suck at guarding low blows, I don't know. Give these guys a protective cup, fuck's sake. The Hollow Knight. In the lower mid-30s, but I honestly wouldn't be against making a case to drop him much lower, arguably even into the low 40s. But I know the only reason a decent fraction of you even clicked on this was to specifically see where I placed this boss and whip out your soap boxes if I so much as positioned him a single hair out of place. So in spite of that, I bumped him up 4 or 5 places just to make you wait a little longer for it. Truth be told, this boss is not only a disappointing final encounter, but he really isn't even meant to be that hard. If you're shooting for the true ending, he's only really there as a gateway boss to the actual final final encounter. Plus, you, know, you gotta think for a second, you're clashing nails with a zombified, brainless, conscienceless, moralless skeleton, and the most dangerous part about him is the herpes leaking out of his chest. This dude is already on his way out the door for a bundle of reasons. I'd actually be a tad more concerned if he did put up a good fight. This boss doesn't really make sense on multiple levels. Not only do not all three of them fight you at once, which is what it seems like they would do if they really wanted to challenge you, but once defeated, word apparently gets out quicker than a rumor at a private high school about some bitch named Victoria sleeping with everyone on the baseball team. Because the minute they accept you as a worthy challenger, every previously hostile mantis warrior you fought just greets you like a random passerby at a grocery store. The mantis tribe is a pretty big fucking place, so unless they're keeping a hyper-advanced postal system under wraps somewhere, I don't know how the hell word could have spread that quickly, but uh, oh, oh yeah, shit, the boss battle. Well, you fight one and she attacks you with some of the most choreographed and predictable movements you've ever seen, and then you fight two of them at once, where the exact same attacks are used, only faster. Just don't get greedy with your attacks and you'll be fine. I wanted to put Zero a little higher up on the ladder, but seeing as how he shares the same glaring weakness with the rest of his Dream Warrior frat brothers in the game, I just couldn't. Slash him in the ass when he gets near you and trigger the second phase, which I call the General Grievous Maneuver, where two blades become four, but instead of increasing attack variety, the battle just becomes slightly faster than it was previously. The only annoying part about this fight is that sometimes you forget to look at where he throws the blade, because if you aren't paying attention, that same blade will boomerang itself back around and propel right into your unsuspecting asshole. But that's still all good and fine because any challenge this fight has to offer is immediately nullified by the cheesable going under the platform technique for a quick heal and laughing in his ethereal spirit face because he can't do shit about it. How pissed off at someone must you be to devolve into such primal instinct that you literally weaponize your own feces and throw it at your assailant? Well, I tried asking this guy here, but he didn't sit still for more than a half second at a time, so it didn't really seem like he was up for that much conversation. This boss fight really did nothing but give me massive amounts of respect for dung beetles, and how physically built they must be to roll up shit balls larger than they are and toss them around like paper fucking planes. Anticipating the ricochet physics is more difficult to deal with than really anything this guy has in his arsenal. It's like having three marmoos flying around going ape shit, but outside of that, most of his attacks are pretty predictable as the sunrise itself, and getting him down to half health triggers a second battle phase where he- seriously, just go ahead, guess what he does. Like, please, seriously, just take a guess. Yep, he activates the maximum overdrive and just starts doing everything with a slightly larger sense of urgency. If you can beat his first phase, you can beat his second. I remember the glory days of Hollow Knight where Quick Slash cost one notch less, you were considered a god if you beat Vanilla Radiance, and Nosk was the biggest bitch in the whole game. He would literally just run to one side of the arena, screech like he stubbed his toe on the middle platform, and then run to the other side. The Hidden Dreams update did give him some impressive new moves, but that doesn't matter much when he still has a screech that foreshadows every single running attack ever. Not even Nosk's infection attack where he just stands in the middle of the room and starts flinging his snot everywhere can reach you so long as you stay ducked under the crevice of this platform. The only in the works is when he launches up to the ceiling and leaks orange globs of cancer onto the arena, and these can and will catch you under that crevice, so don't be whipping out your launch air or anything expecting to be safe the entire time. Grimchild and Glowing Womb can still reach him on the ceiling though, so if you want to take the cheese route then go ahead and lace yourself up with these bad boys and just let them do all the heavy lifting for you. 
And now for unpopular opinion number two. The brooding Moloch, by some unfathomable miracle of God, managed to worm all the way up to my 20s. Not only is the brooding Moloch a big brooding bitch to even find and get to in the first place, but if you so choose, it can be one of the earliest fights in the game. If you prefer to fight the boss this early on, you can just tell that Mantis Claw to fuck itself by downstriking the spikes with your nail and climbing the wall that way. The downside being none of the nail lengthening charms, or any charms I'd recommend for this fight you've actually reached yet. The technique here is to ping pong yourself back and forth to avoid his claw slashes. Strike and then back away, strike a couple more times, then wash, rinse, dry, repeat. His vomit ability is a general everything in that single direction must die attack, but you can dodge all that mess by literally just jumping over him. Make any progress in the game whatsoever and this boss pretty much becomes like shooting fish in a barrel with the shotgun. And the fish was already dead. This next one is a tag team fight featuring the Obel's bigger, more obese cousin-in-laws. But the only thing that makes this fight even somewhat annoying is the fact that there are in fact two of them. Tweedledee and Tweedle Dickhead over here take turns splashing around their sweat beads at you. Fighting two of them at once makes it hard to keep track of how much health one would have versus the other. And God help you if you get caught under one as they begin revving up their sweat cannons. I swear to God it's like the game just fires up the old RNG and just decides, well, looks like we're gonna take some of your health away now and there isn't shitting damn you can do about it. When you finally bench one of them, the second gets a health boost, works himself up into a frenzy, and begins showing you his impression of a pinball. Sadly, I thought this phase to be significantly easier, because once the threat of being double teamed goes away, you can finally put all your attention in one spot. Simply put, if you didn't have any trouble with the Crystal Guardian a few bullet points ago, then you probably aren't going to have any trouble with this guy either. Honestly, this enraged pinheaded nutsack only barely made it into the early 20s because I actually did manage to die because I wasn't paying attention, and then realized the game smugly positioned my shade right in the middle of the boss room. So I either had to waste my soul and blind fire a spell from across the room to try and aggro it, or just give my balls a tug and fight them both at the same time. The enraged guardian now deals double damage with every attack, and that's usually enough to make beginners more afraid of this guy than they should be. But with the proper timing and the proper common sense to not jump face first into a fucking laser, this boss is just a cardboard cutout of the last guy you fought. The No Eyes boss is sort of like finding a needle in a haystack, only with a bunch of pissed off spirits and shit trying to kill you. Fighting her isn't that big of a challenge, and the boss itself probably shouldn't be this high on the list, but her teleportation habits can sometimes get really frustrating. Stack that on top of limited visibility and a platforming arena that demands just enough of your attention for you to accidentally shish kebab yourself if you aren't careful. Any sort of soul gathering charm you have might be useful here, since you're going to be dodging and jumping a lot more than you'll be actually fighting. Honestly, your greatest enemy in this fight is the parameters of your own patience. This isn't rush hour, there's no time limit, you're not gonna miss a meeting if you take too long. Eat this elephant one bite at a time. Fight slowly and whenever you have an opening, just jump up and whack your lights out. Hey, Vengefly King, mind if I copy your homework from last night? Uh, sure, man, just don't make it look obvious. This is one of the world's select few cases where putting wings on the back of something already terrifying actually has the adverse effect. I don't know about anyone else, but part of what made the Nosk encounter in the Deep Nest so tense was the jerky, crawly animations. You never are quite sure of what he wants to do or where he wants to go, but stitch a pair of wings on this bad boy like a botched elementary school paper mache science project, and suddenly all of that tension is pretty much gone. It also doesn't help that the setting has changed from a dark cave to a gladiatorial arena, which kind of takes a lot of the eeriness out of it, but the winged version has basically the same attacks as Nosk and the Vengefly King put together. An easy to dodge, swooping charge coupled with that attack where he barfs up orange soda, and you're given just barely enough time to register where all the projectiles land, which can lead to proactively dashing straight into the line of fire and taking one in the face when you would have been perfectly fine just standing still. Galleon is one of those kill him quickly or he'll kill you quickly kind of bosses. He has an underwhelming scythe attack that he winds up for a good few seconds like he's trying to recall his marching band days as a flag spinner, but as you quickly realize, taking him down past I think 60% of his health spawns in a tiny little scythe that's just barely inconspicuous enough for you to not pay attention to it while trying to dodge the main attack. And at 30%, he spawns in a second one. Thankfully, if you're heading out with the right charms, this fight can be wrapped up pretty quickly. He's got a massive tanky frame, which means a nice big big ass hitbox for you to sink a few spells into, and once he fires up that third scythe, you are going to want to end the fight as soon as possible. So just rev up some of that spell twister shaman stone double team action and howling wraith this fat bastard back into his grave. 
And speaking of getting double teamed, it's always worth remembering that numbers do not equal strength. And this fight here is a living, breathing, walking evidence of that argument. The first phase is a solo battle against Oro. Just imagine fighting the Watcher Knights, now cast a Sloga spell, and then take away all but one of them. And congratulations, you're now fighting Oro, a slower, tankier Watcher Knight with none of that annoying ass spinny spinny Beyblade bullshit cancer, which we'll get to that later. Smack him around until his brother comes in like a TF2 medic to revive his ass, and from there the fight actually does get a little challenging. Yes, ladies and gents, a second phase that introduces new attacks. I like decking myself out with a full strength build and just face tanking one of them until they die. Dodging both of them at the same time can get pretty annoying, so I do everything I can to erase one of them as soon as possible. And next up is Uwu. Nope. No, uh, that's, uh, that's an M. Yep, that's an M. Anyways, I'm gonna have to ask you to hold your dislikes for a second and allow me to justify my- oh. Oh, oh my god. Really? You're still just gonna dislike it anyway? Yeah, I see you asshole, you aren't being clever. Fine, fine, go ahead then. I was sort of perplexed on where exactly to put this guy because the vanilla boss is more annoying than he is actually difficult, but the god home version of this boss is a triple decker buttfuck Reuben sandwich with a side of coleslaw. The vanilla boss is done with the NPC Quirrell and this dude controls the pace of the fight whether you want him to or not. But if your spells are powerful enough once Quirrell decides to stop window shopping and actually do some fucking work, you can send this card to the graveyard at the cost of only three abyss shrieks. Whereas in the gone home, the only way to take down his jelly shield of his is to literally knock Umas into his body. And mind you, that's a fuck of a lot harder than it sounds, because they'll either misfire and head right for your face, or they'll spawn in on the exact opposite end of the arena while you're busy gliding through his dumbass electrified pachinko machine. The Hive Knight boss is your standard sword wielder warrior with a decent close range attack variety and a surprisingly deep health pool. Again, Sharp Shadow gives you the nice security of being able to just literally run right through him while also doing damage. He's got lunges, he's got exploding balls, and he has an interesting attack where he belches 12 bees into the air, five of them realize they forgot their car keys or something, and only seven of them actually swoop down and attack you. The Hive Knight jumps and bounces around like his ass is made of rubber, which can trick the player into thinking you need to match his speed in order to handle the boss effectively. Oh, he's over there. I guess I gotta slash your- Oh, now he's over there. Gotta dash and make sure- now, No, now he's over there. Now he's back there again. Now a sword is in my eye. Ow. And this honestly isn't true. Take things slow and let him come to you. Maybe catch him standing still and get in a few good hits while he's busy vomiting his children into the sky. Hornet's second fight, Hornet Sentinel, is everything the first fight was, only now she has three times the HP and three times the kill you. This is where I'd remind newcomers to not slack off on those pale ore fragments. If you really invest enough time into upgrading your nail to a better capacity, that nail of yours will thank you for it, I promise. Don't be like me on my first playthrough and get all your strength from charms and shit because it just doesn't work as well. And it can really make the health pools of later bosses feel deeper than Mariana's fucking trench, so word to the wise, at least try and look for a few on your way to the king Kingdom's Edge, because this fight really doesn't have to be that long. During her second phase, she'll begin planting spiky death seeds all over the walls that can sting a little, yes, but like most objects in the game, even the most hazardous of obstacles can be thoroughly countered by the delicate art of smacking it the fuck away from you. There's just something about the tempo of this fight that makes everything really fun. His dive attacks are just easily dodgeable enough for you to fantasize about being Hollow Knight Batman for a couple seconds. He has some fireball attacks that leave you prone to overthinking where they're gonna go, which leads to you headbutting a giant spout of fire like the cognitively deficient idiot you are. And he's even courteous enough to give you an attack that might as well be Grim holding up a cheap cardboard protest sign that reads Healing Time. There are two ways to approach this one. There's either the traditional way that requires a thorough analysis of Grim's moveset, dodging and jumping at the right times, striking and backing off when necessary to avoid his damage, or if you're like me, i.e. a total hopeless bastard, arm yourself with every spell charm in the books, bitch slap that bowing asshole in the face as the fight begins to send him into his flame spawner attack, and then just scream into his ass until he asks you to leave. The White Defender is the Dung Defender in his heyday. Hollow Nest honor and glory restored and with a name that just barely limbos itself under the bar of accidental racism. The White Defender, in a sentence, is no joke. Well, 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 I don't know. I mean, he's kind of a joke, but not. He's averagely difficult. The fight should definitely be taken seriously, but he isn't that far at my list to warrant any sort of grinding or preparation past readjusting my charm build once or twice. But great god almighty, this guy has some energy. Any attempt to heal during the fight might as well be coupled with a sign laced around your left horn that says, free ass kicking. Any charm that buffs your strength is worth considering here, because even in his heyday, he still seems to take pretty long pauses in between attacks. 
The collector boss must have really had a hard time developing proper finger strength as a kid because the only way he knows how to open his jars is to jump 10 feet in the air and throw them on the ground like Andy Samberg. I imagine this boss to just be angrily sorting through his pantry because his stomach is growling for a fucking PB&J but he forgot where he put his grape preserves. Each jar has the possibility to contain one of three enemies, either a vengefly, a balder, or an asshole. Uh, uh, aspid. This is one of those fights where you'll end up paying more attention to the arena than the actual boss because those jars deal contact damage and they will fuck you all the way up if you don't pay attention. And in addition to all that nonsense, now you have a fly buzzing around the arena that wasn't there before. Getting the coiled nail upgrade from the nail smith means those pesky creatures die in one hit, and the less time you spend taking care of his little minions, the more time you can devote to thoroughly slicing up this jumpy sugar high bastard before he leaps back into the ceiling again. Fittingly enough, this is the easiest of the subgroup I call sequel bosses because they're really nothing more than a sugar-rushed, fine-tuned power lifter version of their previous selves. This boss is honestly really annoying to fight if you aren't paying attention to all the infected water balloons bouncing all over the walls. They spawn in pretty frequently and they can swarm you so fast that any attack delays you would have been able to heal through are now spent having to swat away these bastards. So unless you've got a balder shell or a defender's crest, you can say goodbye to any healing options. He does actually get pretty easily staggered though. I think it takes like nine hits, regardless of nail strength, to put him into a stalemate position where he catches his breath for a second or two. Aside from being faster and his slam attack distributing six globs of ew instead of four, he's pretty much the same. Playing through the Godmaster DLC was a humbling experience. Up to this point, you've spent your entire journey through the kingdom exchanging blows with knights, flying wizards, crystal warriors, and giant bees. You've vanquished dung beetles, invaded dream spirits, and flushed out an entire mantis tribe with a broken nail. And now Bob Ross over here just enters the building and starts beating your ass with his giant filbert brush. Paintmaster Shio has various assortments of attacks and paints he uses to beat the devil out of you, and paint happy little clouds all over your happy little ass and send you back to your happy little bench like the happy little shithead you happy little are. Once you've memorized his attacks, however, Paint Master Picasso becomes only a matter of good reaction time and not getting overzealous with how many hits per pause. Again, fellas, just because he's fighting fast and jumping all over the place like an asshole doesn't mean you have to. The God Tamer is really nothing special, aside from being the final enemy in the third and final Colosseum stage. And I'm gonna be honest, the only reason I even thought of this boss to be somewhat difficult for me is because you've already been put through the ringer and a half, and every single patron of the Colosseum has taken turns beating you over the head with their respective weapons. So by the time you've even made it to this fight, you're already coughing up a variety of bodily substances and fighting the allure of unconsciousness. Regardless of any circumstances, make the beast a priority in your fight because not only can the beast be finished off pretty easily, but if you kill the beast, the rider herself will throw down her weapon like a child that just got asked to give his brother the controller and just not fight you anymore. So as soon as the game allows it, you should already be firing your load right into that fat six-eyed face. I promise there are still some original bosses left somewhere on this list. Not every single boss up to my final spot is going to be a souped up clone of its original. We still got some uncharted ground ahead of us, just be patient. Everything I've told you about not matching the speed the enemy has, I think, has been solid advice up until now. Now I want you to just take that rule book I gave you and jettison that piece of shitterature right out the window and into the dumpster. Because the only way you are going to land any attack at all is if you are constantly in lockstep with his teleports. He has the same attacks as the original Soul Master, save his clock attack with which spawns six Dragon Balls instead of four. I'm beginning to detect a theme here. And these, again, can be surprisingly easy to dodge. I actually found out that if you stand somewhere in the middle of the arena, 90% of the time, it'll just pass right over you. Nail strength charms are good, but nail lengthening, I think, is better because he really does zip around like a dickhead. So any extra inch you can squeeze in on him is, I believe, a good advantage. The Traitor Lord really has come a long way since his pre-Lifeblood days. The Traitor Lord got so sick of getting kicked around and shit that he changed his diet and started beefing up at the gym, and he comes back with a new array of attacks and behaviors in one of the most shocking before and after comparisons I have ever witnessed. He can throw scythes and produce ceiling high shock waves that you have basically no choice but to shadow dash through, but his two close quarters attacks still remain the same, albeit double damage, meaning you can equip Sharp Shadow and Grubberfly Elegy along with a Lifeblood Charm to make sure those light beams get some extra reinforcement dash through one attack, shoot some light at him, dash, shoot, dash, shoot, dead. Now I just made that sound a lot easier than it actually is because your timing needs to be basically immaculate, but the good news is if you're able to stay close to him and keep the pressure on, he won't even have a chance to show you any of his new ranged attacks, which is something you better count your lucky fucking stars over. 
First off, upstrike the wall here, climb to the top of the ceiling and destroy the chandelier. It removes one of the six knights from the fight and you have absolutely no reason to not know this exists. The watcher knights can be defeated one of two ways and it sort of depends on whatever play style you're comfortable with. If you're just that much of a badass, you can use charms like sharp shadow if you're comfortable with dodging and weaving in between their offense, but you can also make yourself into a tank with health and invincibility charms out the ass and just outlast them with spell attacks. Shaman stone is pretty good here too because every now and then the two currently active knights may conveniently align themselves ahead of you, meaning you can basically get in twice the damage with one shade soul and you have a nice little clip for your next trick shot montage. These assholes have never not given me trouble and I have no idea why. I get the feeling this boss fight might be the breeding grounds for a lot of different clashing opinions, but the good thing is the individual health of any one of the six knights is dismally low, making it pretty easy to keep tabs on how you're progressing. The failed champion boss fight is the much anticipated sequel to the false knight and unlike its brother actually isn't a complete pushover. This guy is what it would look like if a pro wrestler stole a shitty suit of armor from his local peddler's mall and then drank his weight in Red Bull because for the love of god. For such a large frame he sure has the energy to jump around a lot. Club attacks are faster and much more frequent and the shockwave he sends after you is just around twice as tall which tricks you into thinking you're required to double jump over it. But unless you're a pleb and haven't gotten the shade cloak yet you spoiled bad Bastard, phasing through these waves is a cinch. It's not even that his attack patterns are that complicated or that hard to maneuver around, but his massive health pool can really drag out the fight and make it feel like an endurance run. And here come the trump card bosses. You know how I keep saying it's usually a bad habit to try and match the speed of the boss? Well, Sly is the living epitome of that rule. He borrows attacks from all the previous nail sages, including a really comical cyclone slash where he just takes that oversized sway hander of his and spins himself right round like he's revving up a fucking Beyblade. If that last guy was using Red Bull as a pick me up, then consider this dude just full on cocaine abuse. This boy got combos for days, but he's just vulnerable enough after his main combo finisher to get in a couple quick hits. There's a small window of healing time in between his first and second phase which is exclusively spin attacks. And from here on it's just a matter of finding your rhythm and getting in a single hit after each spin. His HP in this phase actually isn't that impressive so wearing him down little by little is I think a good way to finish the fight. The Sisters of Battle boss conveniently shares an acronym with one of my favorite expressions of profanity. So as grueling as this fight was, I'm glad that it at least had the courtesy to deliver such easy jokes to my doorstep. Instead of separating phases in between dueling one mantis and dueling two of them, the second phase just goes full on hold my beer mode and throws all three of them at you at once. I've actually seen montages where it's possible to downstrike them as they come in with a forward lunge and not even hit the ground because that's literally how fast they attack you. This means some of their attacks will also overlap with each other. Each other. Two of them could be on the walls throwing their lances at you for instance while the third is still going apeshit trying to run you through. So dodging or jumping over one attack might very possibly and sometimes inevitably send you into the attack of another. Markov. This boss has no right to be this big of a thorn in my ass. His offense comprises of a rotary shield and a poorly put together barrage of needles, all sealed up with a stationary shield spin so drawn out that you could accidentally sneeze and drop your controller and still have enough time to heal when you picked it back up. Markov spends a lot of his time in the air, but it seems like every instance you would have otherwise had an opening, you either get greedy and end up swallowing a needle or his shield gets in the way. The only for sure way to score a good few hits on him is to catch him staying still during his shield attack. But most of the time he won't even start winding that up until he's two pixels away from headbutting the fucking ceiling. Any instance of his vulnerability is taken away by his tendency to fly as far away from you as possible. And this asshole practically dares you to chase after him too. I swear to god if they had actual voice acting in this game he'd be throwing rocks at you and calling you a pussy. Oh and if that sounds hard enough imagine going against him in the god home and fighting him without a fucking floor. Don't ever let your mother tell you moths can't hurt you because that moth might just have the power to straight up command the very essence of light itself. The Radiance actually has the most health out of any boss in the vanilla game, being trumped by only her larger, more successful sister, Absolute Radiance, and we will be getting to her in just a moment. She's out here summoning laser pillars, energy beams, and spamming the swords of revealing light at you, and every attack here looks intelligently placed that seems to lure you into dodging one attack only to be face fucked by the other. There's usually no less than two different attack cycles going on at once and there's just a lot to pay attention to, in addition to dealing two masks of damage per attack. And the stakes are escalated even further because dying here means fighting the Hollow Knight once again just to access the boss. It's exactly the difficulty you'd expect from an end game boss, but unfortunately acknowledging that going in doesn't make it any easier. So grab that shaman stone and get to work on some spell spamming because this one's gonna take a while.
Nabbing my spot number four is the pure vessel boss fight, which is the guy that the vanilla Hollow Knight would talk about to his kids when telling stories about how intimidating and badass he used to be. Just hop into the fourth pantheon in Gods and Glory and bend over as this regal ass kicking simulator does its work. Most attacks from the pure vessel seem to have a lackluster counterpart that was dished out by the Hollow Knight. Pure vessel summons swords from the ground while Hollow Knight can only create little infected volcano spouts. Pure vessel throws daggers at you whereas Hollow Knight just opens up his chest and ejects lumps of concentrated syphilis from his body, but this is also a Hollow Knight that still has his head screwed on straight, which means less of that weird seppuku action and more backsteps and parries and shit. Despite this dude being tough as steel, the battle actually does feel like it goes by pretty quickly. Turns out wearing him down little by little actually adds up when you have your nail decked out with every single strength upgrade ever. You do have times to heal as long as you're good at basic addition, and by that I mean please don't try to heal two masks at a time just because he does double damage. For instance, if you're at six masks, healing up to eight versus only healing up to 7 won't really matter because you're still gonna die in 4 hits anyway, so just heal one at a time and then resume your offense. And if you'd like a nice hearty laugh with your ass-kicking simulator, you need not look any further than the battle with Grey Prince Zote. Zote conquers his opponents with a tried and true strategy of, if I don't know what I'm doing then you sure as shit don't either, and the sad part is it actually kinda works, especially if you grind him to the point where he might as well do your entire health bar of damage in a single hit. It takes a special trained eye to identify all of his attacks and actually dodge them properly. Hell, half his moveset is just him falling on his ass and involuntarily creating shock waves, but the animations blend together so seamlessly that you can barely even tell when he's winding something up. And to top it all off with little pissant zote flies that attack you independently of the main boss. This has got to be one of the most condescending fights I've ever been in. He just fumbles around tripping over his own feet and shit and just somehow accidentally ends up being one of the hardest bosses in the game. It's taken us a damn long time to stumble across an adversary worthy of the King prefix, but I believe we finally found one. Nightmare King Grim has many fighting advantages over its counterpart, the huge difference being he's actually smart enough to teleport off the arena before he shoots his demonic stalagmites at you. This fight wouldn't be nearly as tough as it were if he didn't rush off like he missed an appointment as soon as every single attack was finished. You are pretty much limited to a single hit per attack, and honestly that's not even a guarantee. And getting hit once can throw off your entire rhythm as you fall into a downward cast of sensory overload where you finally just give up and watch the ensuing ass beating. This is a fight where tempo really matters, and if you can find a good dodging rhythm, the only thing you have left to do is master the timing behind when you should attack. Downstrike when he's lunging at you, inch forward to dodge the four fire pillars, jump and shadow dash through the bats and hit him with a nail art, and if you're managing even a single hit per attack, trust me, you're doing just about as much as you really can. So in a sentence, grab a strength charm and just get to work. If you've managed to make it all the way here and fight literally every other boss in the game back to back, you're going to be wrestling with this guy. And Jesus Christ on a fucking surfboard, this boss has just about every negative thing I've said about all other fights. This dude has it all. Annoying ass teleportation, double damage, swords of revealing light that are spaced out just enough to be the most uncomfortable thing in the world to jump over, projectile attacks written with a code that's literally smarter than you are, topped off with the agonizing anxiety of knowing you will be fighting everything over again if you let her put you up against the ropes. She's got more phases than a middle school scene kid in the late 2000s, and it seems with every phase you have less and less fighting room to work with, all the way to the very final phase which expects you to hopscotch back and forth between just two platforms. Dodging attacks is the absolute first thing you should prioritize over everything else. Healing, sinking in damage, even repositioning yourself to a different platform. Forget about all of that shit until you've either got a window of safety to move closer to the boss, or if by happenstance she teleports closer to you. Leading the orbs off screen for whatever reason makes them just not come back, and the horizontal swords travel fast enough for you to just jump over without the need to waste a valuable shadow dash. I've brought up fighting your own impatience for a lot of the harder boss fights, but this is especially true against Absrad. The amount of time you should be spending on the offensive is minimal at best, and that means you do not attack or use any spells unless there are no incoming enemy attacks and she is literally on top of you, period. End of discussion. The build I had on my first victory was the Soul Leader Shaman Stone Spell Twister Trifecta, along with Grub Song, and I think I threw a Mark of Pride in there just for the conveniently long reach. The Abyss Shriek spell coupled with the Shaman Stone is one of the highest DPS attacks available, and when windows of opportunity are as few and far between as they are here, high DPS means a hell of a lot. Granted, it'll feel spammy and kind of illegitimate when you do it, but hey, a boss beaten is a beaten boss, so. Anyways, I've been talking for upwards of 40 minutes now, and it feels like someone is massaging my throat with sandpaper, so I'm gonna call this one here and drench myself with the largest bottle of water I can find. I've also got a Devil May Cry 5 boss ranking list that you should take a look at if you're a fan of third-person brawlers and such. Until then, I'm Rusty, thanks for tuning into The Forge, and I'll see you next time. Peace.